Ever since getting the studio space, we finally had some time and excuses to do content that we expressed interest in doing about a year and a half ago. So this is the R9-290X. You might remember it. It's one of the previous, this specific one is a reference card from AMD from several years ago. Uh, predated the 390X, predictably, the RX 480, the Fury X, the uh, RX 580, and so forth. So it's a good couple generations old, depending on how you define generation in this, this, uh, this instance. And today we are retesting it for modern games. So we're looking at DirectX 12 APIs, looking at modern DX11 implementations versus existing AMD and NVIDIA products to see how it stacks up uh, in modern gaming and if it's worth, at this point, upgrading. Before that, this video is brought to you by MassDrop and the PC37X gaming headset with professional-grade Sennheiser noise-canceling microphone. The PC37X headsets are what we use in the office for phone interviews where audio and mic quality are critical, making for a convenient, high-performance solution for gaming or professional work. The headphones come with a detachable 10-foot cable for safe storage during travel, a standard 3.5mm plug, and soft foam for firm but comfortable fit over the ears. Learn more at the link in the description below. So like I said, we wanted to do this content a long time ago, originally. Uh, just now got to it, but we're, we're here now. So this is the only 290X we have still in the lab, and uh, it is a reference model. But before anyone gets upset that it's not going to be representative of their own card's performance, note that we overclock this to a point where it's, it's a bit faster than most of the AIB partner models of the 290X when they launched. So we have stock and overclock numbers. The overclock numbers represent pretty much any overclocked 290X because uh, we did max out the fan on this to make sure it could reach those higher frequencies and uh, my hearing has now been permanently damaged as a result of it because it's about 60 decibels when it's running at full speed. So try having that next to your head for about six hours. And uh, other than that, I mean, the card was a flagship. It was high end. And this particular model is 4 gigabytes. The 390X popularized an 8 gigabyte alternative that was a refresh of the 290X. And uh, 4 gigabytes, though, for most of these tasks, you'll see is actually fine because it becomes limited elsewhere first. For differences versus other cards, look at something like an RX 580, which is an RX 480. That card is a, a modern, well, it, it's kind of a flagship. It's a bit of a weird place to be. Because it was a flagship of Polaris, but it was never really a high-end product. It was always mid-range competitor with something like a uh, 1060. But this versus that. So the 290X has more TMUs at 176 versus 144 texture map units on the RX 580, which is a 480. It's got more ROPs at 64 versus 32. Now the, the uh, capabilities of those ROPs will change over time as architecture advances, but uh, having more is still going to be beneficial. And this in particular is something that we want you to pay attention to during these benchmarks because with the increase in ROPs, there's a benefit to things like anti-aliasing. When we do our GTA 5 testing, it uses a two-tap MSAA. It also benefits higher resolution. It's kind of the same thing there where you're dealing with uh, multiple samples with AA or just more pixels with higher resolution. So ROPs will be where you might see the difference between a 580 and a 290X close uh, as the resolution increases as those ROPs are tapped more heavily in their rendering workload. So that's something to pay attention to. And uh, ROPs, it's, it's, it's where the output is effectively assembled into what becomes the image, a bitmapped image uh, at the end of the pipe. So we're testing with the reference card. We overclocked it, blasted the fan speeds, all that stuff. Let's get through the testing today. We've got a lot of uh, modern games. We have GTA 5 is an older representation, but this card is circa I don't know, 2013 or 14 or something. So it is quite old at this point, but uh, it's worth testing. So let's get into it and then we'll talk conclusions. Sniper Elite 4 will start us out. Before displaying results, remember that one of the most interesting areas to look is going to be for scaling performance between two fixed goal posts as we change resolutions. If the distance between those posts shrinks, that's indicative of an architectural advantage or deficit at the new resolution. We'll set the RX 580 and R9 290X at stock settings for these goalposts. Sniper Elite 4 gives us a well-optimized DX12 title to test with, which is valuable because we want higher frame rates even at 4K to better illustrate some of those scaling gaps. Keep in mind that the 290X came out long before 4K was popularized and also before DirectX 12 was even released. 1080p still had almost all of the market share at this point. 
At 4K, we see the R9 290X stock card at 38 FPS average, with lows surprisingly close by at 32 and 30 FPS, 1% and 0.1% low. We'll look at frame times in a moment, but just stick with the averages for now. Overclocking headroom was limited and capped at about 1060 megahertz for core, getting us to 41 FPS average and climbing 7.9% over the R9 290X stock card. These performance figures pegged the 290X and its overclocked counterpart at rough equivalence with the RX 580 8GB card, not too distant from the new RX 590 Fatboy. This is without yet considering power consumption, mind you, so that field of things has potentially changed a bit as well. The GTX 1060 is just surpassed by our 290X results, as is the GTX 970. As for those posts we mentioned, the R9 290X stock GPU allows the RX 580 8GB stock GPU to hold a lead of about 2.9%. Transitioning to the more limited 1080p results, we now see that the 290X has a stock frame rate of about 98 FPS average, allowing the RX 580 8GB card a lead of 9.4% with its 107 FPS average. The fact that the R9 290X closed the gap at 4K suggests to us that the 580 becomes limited in its ROPs and TMUs, but primarily ROPs. The 290X is better equipped on this front just in pure ROP count, leaving its biggest limitation as frequency, which is why the card has more trouble keeping up at the lower resolutions. Once again, the RX 580 gets slammed with higher demand on the Pixel pipeline, where it becomes more limited. The R9 290X pulls ahead and... That's kind of where we see the shrinking gap. The same pattern would emerge with anti-aliasing as well, as it's effectively increasing the sample rate in the same way, or at least with the same intensity, that increasing resolution would do. This is also becoming ROPS bound, at least when you start modifying the anti-aliasing settings. So even if you play with lower resolutions than 4K, but you like higher AA or something like that, you'll still see these same types of behaviors emerge. As for 1080p performance on the whole, the 290X performs behind the GTX 1066 gigabyte and ahead of the RX 574 gigabyte cards. Frame times are what we're most curious about. As a reminder, frame time plots demonstrate the frame to frame variance in time to present a new frame. This is a measure of frame to frame intervals in milliseconds, so lower is better versus benchmark progression on the bottom axis. The more consistent each point on the line is to the previous, the better the user experience. Deviation from the mean in excess of 8 to 12 milliseconds becomes noticeable to most gamers. The R9 290X does well in this department with Sniper Elite 4. To Sniper's credit, the game is remarkably well built, but the 290X still needs the right hardware to keep frame pacing consistent. In this title, we don't see too much deviation from the mean frame time, with the biggest variance, at least frame to frame variance, in the form of 3 to 4 millisecond swings. This is completely acceptable, and as you can see, isn't too distant from the modern RX 590's performance. The 590 has fewer peaks on average, but the difference in consistency is unnoticeable overall for most players. The RTX 2060 is also plotted as an example of the most modern architecture, where we're nearing an ideal frame time plot. The takeaway though is that the 290X does well on frame time consistency in this particular title, and that's despite some early life issues with frame time consistency in the 290X. Many of these were patched up with later driver updates, but the rest would likely be more game or API dependent. F1 2018 is next, giving us a DirectX 11 game that uses the same API as almost all of the market back when the 290X released. Just for scaling reasons, we'll look at 4K results, despite this card not really being meant for it in especially 2019. At 4K, the R9 290X 4GB card ends up at about 33 FPS average, ranking it as similar to the GTX 1066GB and GTX 970. The RX 580 8GB outperforms the 290X 4GB by 4.6%, landing at 34 FPS average. We can also learn from the 390X result, which shows a 34 FPS average. This card is a refresh of the 290X with a higher frequency and double the memory capacity. In this title, it rapidly becomes clear that the memory is not the primary limitation, as performance only increases by a few percentage points and the lows don't really change all that much. The 290X and 390X are more limited by the GPU than by the memory. Moving on to 1440p, we see similar resolution scaling as the previous game. The RX 580 stock GPU's 56.6 FPS average is 9.1% ahead of the R9 290X's 51.9 FPS average, posting a relative gain in performance for the RX 580. 
Again, we think this is because the 290X can leverage its increased ROPS and texture units at higher resolutions or higher anti-aliasing values, closing the gap as resolution increases. That doesn't mean it's playable at those higher resolutions or that it's better, just that the gap closes. It illustrates how the GPUs scale. For 1440p resolution, the 290X is still reasonably playable in this title. Dropping settings from ultra high to just high or similar would make for a consistent 60fps and beyond. Comparatively, the 290X does about as well as the GTX 970, although the 290X's lows manage higher results, with the 390X not too distant. The 390X's extra memory doesn't get leveraged in a meaningful way for this benchmark, and versus some modern cards, the 290X is outperformed by the GTX 1060 and RX 580 alike. We don't see too much improvement for the 290X at 1080p, moving up to 65 FPS average and with still minimal gains from overclocking. The RX 580 8GB runs at 72 FPS average for a lead of 11.6%. To recap this title, we see 11.6% improvement in the RX 580 at 1080p, 9.1% at 1440p, and 46 at 4K, showing very clear performance improvements in the higher frequency, newer cards, particularly at lower resolutions. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is up next, giving us a DirectX 12 title for another modern look at performance. DX12 didn't officially launch until 2015, so the 290X was made well before the new API saw any adoption. At 4K, the 290X obviously struggles at 24 FPS average, making it largely unplayable with these settings. The RX 580 doesn't do much better at 25 FPS average, with the RX 590 at 28 FPS average. Let's move on to something more reasonable. At 1440p, the 290X runs at about 42 FPS average, with the GTX 1060 functionally tied with the 290X. The differences are inside of error margins, so we can't state if one is better than the other in any meaningful capacity. The RX 580 8GB leads at 45 FPS average, with the 590 at 50 FPS average, and Vega 56 at 62 FPS average. 1080p positions the R9 290X in playable territory, even at, with these higher settings, at 60 FPS average for the overclocked version. And that's about where most partner cards would fall, and 58 FPS average for the stock model. That puts the 290X as comparable to the GTX 1060 6GB and behind the RX 580 8GB. Far Cry 5 uses geometrically complex meshes and longer view distances, making it one of the more draw call intensive benchmarks we run for this. At 4K, Far Cry 5 positions the 290X at 26 FPS average, right between the GTX 970 and 980 cards, and affording the RX 580 a lead of 8.3% at 28 FPS average. This isn't particularly playable under these settings, so once again, we're mostly using them for perspective. At 1440p, performance climbs significantly to 43 FPS average, which is about where the RX 570 and 390X perform. NVIDIA's GTX 1066 GB outperforms the 290X by a few percentage points here, with the most modern cards posting significant leads. The RX 580 holds a 16.7% lead, showing one of the largest gaps we've seen between the two yet, but still following the trends that we saw previously. 1080p really carries this trend though, now allowing the RX 580 8GB card a lead of 22%, which is the biggest gain we've seen thus far. As a reminder, that's against 8.3% at 4K and 16.7% at 1440p, so our earlier theory remains consistent. As for raw frame rates, the 290X is still adequate for 60fps and Far Cry 5 at 1080p with these settings, but it's getting a bit long in the tooth. Vega 56 and GTX 1070s or even RTX 2060s would offer considerable performance improvements. As you can see in the chart, it's just a question of do you have budget or do you really care? Because if you're happy at 60 FPS, 1080p, the 290X is still holding on reasonably in most of these games. GTA 5 is a 2015 game and is the oldest on our benchmark, but it's also the most played game out of everything in the test suite. At 4K, GTA 5 lands the R9 290X at 24 FPS average, which is within error of the RX 580, or even slightly leading it, for the first time all bench, and not too distant from the GTX 970. This is more of a synthetic look, of course, since it's not particularly playable. 1440p again posts the R9 290X and RX 580 as roughly equal in performance, we run GTA 5 with 2x MSAA, so it's likely we're seeing a potential ROPS limitation still on the RX 580. It's a good example of how anti-aliasing also impacts performance with these cards.
The 390X does actually post meaningful improvement over the R9 290X here, landing at 53 FPS average, but this is clearly more of a change in frequency than memory capacity, as the overclocked 290X isn't too distant from the 390X stock card. So the card's really not all that different from some of the mid-range modern cards. Power consumption, uh, it's a bit of a different story there, but, and also the thermal design of this cooler was terrible. But if you had a partner model, then that is less of an issue or a non-issue. So it really just comes down to the performance. And of course, if you have a 290X, yes, there's really no harm if you feel like upgrading now. You can buy a modern $300 to $400 card and get a pretty substantial uplift, like Vega 56, for example, in these charts. You saw Vega 56 is significantly improved over the 290X, and that's furthered if you feel like going through some of the power mods that we did uh, with the registry, with PowerPlay tables. So plenty of options there. The, uh, the RTX 20 series, 2060, is an upgrade, and it is better. It feels a bit odd because, I guess, in terms of spend, you're potentially at a bit less than you were when you bought this originally, depending on what price you bought this for. Uh, so 2070 might be a more, more um, comparable price to the original purchasing point of a 290X. But either way, uh, yes, there are significant improvements, of course, in the market. That's really not unexpected. But the interesting takeaway is that the 290X does better at these higher resolutions than relative to other cards that are on market today than at the lower resolutions. And that's because of its, uh, its beefed up ROPS pipeline and extra TMUs and things like that. The, the memory capacity didn't seem to affect performance all that much. It's just that, unfortunately, you can't really leverage the advantages in things like 4K or 1440 too often anyway, 1440 a bit more, because the card just starts falling behind elsewhere, like frequency overall, where AMD has seen significant improvements over the last couple of years. So should you upgrade? Well, it's entirely up to you. You can decide that, but hopefully you've got at least some understanding now with the charts of where this would fall versus today's card, so that when making a purchasing decision for an upgrade, uh, you don't accidentally buy a, a lateral move and get something that's equivalent like an RX 580. It's a bit better. Far Cry 5, it sees a significant improvement at lower resolutions, but overall, an RX 580 is not really much of an upgrade, neither is a GTX 1060, for example. You want to go a bit higher than those cards. So um, that said, for a once flagship to equate the kind of mid-range cards of today uh, is not bad for the mid-range cards of today. It does show progress, and especially progress in price. So that's a good thing, but the goalposts always move with games because games just get harder to render anyway. So that's it for this one, though. This was requested by a lot of you after I had originally suggested the idea, uh, and then, uh, then we forgot. So uh, here it is. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly, or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. I'll see you all next time.